They say the Nobel Prize goes not to the person who has the best answer, but the person who asks the best question. So in this segment called Tell Me Why, we bring together elementary school kids who have a great question and a scientist who can explain it all for us. Today we're joined by Mitch and Zach Septoff, space enthusiasts aged 7 and 10, and Keith Cowing from NASA Watch to discuss outer space. Zach, do you, uh, let's start with you. Do you think that space has an up and a down? Um, yeah, kind of. Not exactly, though. <laughs> Why not? Because, well, some things don't have things that they're orbiting. Why does that make a difference? Um, well, there has to be a down, but we just don't know which way. Well, I just don't know which way down is if you don't have something to orbit. Right. Is that kind of a, a decent uh, summary, Keith? What is up and down in space? Yeah, it's sort of like uh, Buckaroo Banzai says, wherever you go, there you are. You know, and if you're standing on a planet and you're looking around, you know, you know your feet are on the ground and people like to make maps up and give directions. And it usually starts with saying, hey, this means the word in front means in front and back. And then you start using that word with somebody and they get it. And then you say, well, that thing's over a hill. And let me write that down for you. So after a while, you agree to the rules as to where left and right and up and down is. And uh, back in the day, somebody said north is to the one side of the planet and south is the other way. And they said, hey, well, there's a star that always seems to be right over the north. Well, so that's the north part of the sky. Before you know it, you're mapping the sky. And so if you live in the northern hemisphere, you sort of think north is up and south is down. Unless you're in Australia, then they think it's the other way around. <laughs> And you sort of get used to these directions. Now, if you're not on a planet, if you're in a spacecraft, well, sometimes it's good to remember where your feet need to go, but up and down, you can change that if you're weightless. You can say, well, uh, up is here right now, but I need to be working on that, so I'll make up over there. So again, it's wherever you are, that sort of sets the rules. But um, you have to kind of say at some point, you know, I'm here and that's there, and this is a direction and this is another. So. In so many words, I think Zach had it right in the first place. Sort <laughs> Mitch, sort, Mitch and sort Zach, I, uh, when I, I'm from Australia, and I used to have a map that was hanging on my wall where the world was upside down so that Australia was on top and Antarctica was on top and the United States was on the bottom. Mitch, do you think that's, that map was wrong? Um, not really, because <laughs> there is um, the world can flip upside down it orbits and spins so so um, any that... any any way you want to look it up is is up we've got a, a video that i want to show about how motion gets distorted when you're in space when you're in orbit this is a nasa scientist who's in orbit on the international space station and he's playing a real life game of angry birds and he's talking about the way that he fires the birds let's just take a look whoa look at that whoa, all the way down that's an example of a trajectory. It's a straight line from our perspective here. Gravity will attract an object if it's moving in a straight line, and it will no longer move in a straight line. It gets bent, and it goes in a curved trajectory. Keith, how do we use gravity and curved trajectories when we're sending rockets into space? Well, usually, I like to show the picture that some, I think it was Newton or somebody came up with four or 500 years ago where he had an earth and a big tall mountain and a cannon. And in essence, it throws this cannonball in an arc like this, but it throws it so fast that it's always falling around the earth. That's called free fall. And if you're going at the right speed, it's in orbit. Mm. Zach, you know that when they fire uh, rockets into space, when we're going to, to, other, to visit other planets and so on, the they can shoot it near another planet intentionally so that the gravitational pull of the other planet will slingshot the rocket around the planet and give it extra speed and velocity. Did you know that? Uh, no. There you go. <laughs> there you go. You learn a new thing every day. What, is, what do you think gravity is, Zach? Gravity is like, gravity is if some, something weighs, like it depends on how much it weighs to how much gravity it has. So... The, since the Earth weighs so much, it um, it has a lot of gravity. Do you have gravity? Yes, I do, but not too much. <laughs> Mitch, do you do you agree with that? Um, no, because I know one of the laws that um, 
gravity affects all objects the same. It just, what affects them is air resistance from how wide it is. And the heavier it is, the faster it'll drop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I've got that image, uh, by the way, that you were just talking about, Keith, my producers just found it. So here we can look at that. So this is like if you fire something off a mountain, say, let, let's take let's take a look at what I'm looking at. Uh, then it, if you fire it too fast, it'll go out of space, yeah, out like that. It'll just continue on in space. If you if you don't give enough power, it'll just drop down to Earth. But there's just that sweet spot where if you fire it just like that, it just keeps falling around the Earth constantly. That's what you would that that's basically what you're talking about, about being in orbit, right? Exactly. And back, back in the day, when he, before you were even in school, I had an old PDP-8 computer and they had a program called Cannon, where you would fire a cannon shell. And I, that got boring quick, so I hacked it and I changed a few parameters, so I put it into orbit. And it's so simple to do, but, you know, um, these concepts were thought of by people who didn't have computers back in the day. And they just uh, sat there and thought a little bit and said, well, what if I threw it really, really, really fast? And that's where that drawing came from. The thing about the amazing thing about gravity is that, of course, Zach, as you move between two objects, the notion of what's up and what's down depends a lot on whether you're or not you're in the gravitational pull of one object or another. I want to take a look at a little animated clip. This is from a Disney Pixar film, which illustrates this. Take a look at this. Climbing up a ladder. And he's climbing up towards the moon, and while he's still on the Earth, he gets to the top of the ladder, and he's so close to the moon that the moon's gravity starts out starts getting stronger than the Earth's gravity until he falls onto this fictitious moon. Zach, do you think that up and down depends on how on what what body you're closest to? Yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you think that if you actually built a ladder between the Earth and the moon, there'd come a point at which you would have to turn around and start climbing down the ladder instead of climbing up it? Uh. Actually, yeah, no, that's, that's, it's, it depends on the one that has the most gravity. Right. Keith, would that happen if you drew, if you built a ladder between the Earth and the Moon, would there come a point at which you would start feeling like you're heading down towards the gravitational pull of the Moon? Yeah, the ladder might be kind of big and heavy, that's the thing, but I remember back in the day when we were going to the Moon for the first time, and I remember Walter Cronkite saying, and now the spacecraft is under the influence of the Moon. And it has to do with, you know, how fast you're traveling. But, you know, if, if I were to suddenly take you two guys and put you 100 miles in the air, you wouldn't really weigh that much less because you're still relatively close to the Earth. If you're going very fast, you're falling. That's where the whole weightlessness thing comes in. But that, there's, an, there's an interesting idea where now they're talking about space elevators. Instead of a ladder, they're going to have a big cable going way up into space anchored to an asteroid, and then you just ride an elevator up. And you could start to see those mechanics in place there, but how far the cable is thousands of miles long and so forth. But if you had a ladder that, that tall, I suspect it would be so heavy that it would collapse on itself before you ever got close to the point where the moon's involved. Zach, wrap us up here by telling me what's so cool about Pluto. <laughs> um, that uh, is a dark planet. <laughs> Wait, Pluto isn't a planet though, is it? Um, it kind of is, but it's some kind of planet, but not exactly a, a, a real planet. It's a dwarf planet. It's one of the small, small planets. Okay. Well, thanks for, thanks for filling us in. Great to talk to you guys again. You can come back on HuffPost Live whenever you want. Keith, always a pleasure. Uh, stay tuned. There's lots more coming up right here on HuffPost Live.